Welcome to this second event organized by the Aberdeen Italian Circle. As you know, 2021 is the celebration of the 700th anniversary of Dante Alighieri's death. Uh, Dante Alighieri, the father of Italian language. So the Aberdeen Italian Circle is going to celebrate uh, this occasion with a special guest. We, have, we are absolutely thrilled to have Professor Nick Haveli. Um, Nick Haveli is Emeritus Professor in the Department of English and Related Literature at the University of, War of York, where he taught courses in English and Italian literature for over four decades. His recent work on Dante includes um, the Blackwell Introductory Guide to the Poet, two edited collections of essays on Dante's reception in the 19th century, and the book for which he received the Leverhulme Research Fellowship uh, that is entitled Dante's British Public, Readers and Texts from the 14th Century to the Present, that was published by Oxford University Press. In this current um, year, uh, to celebrate this seventh uh, centenary of Dante's death, he's also publishing uh, two volumes. One is a new translation of the Purgatorio by 16 comp contemporary poets, and is called After Dante, Poets in uh, Purgatory. And uh, he's uh, co-editing this volume with Bernard uh, O'Donoghue. And another um, book is called Dante Beyond Borders, Context and Reception. And this is a collection of essays by an international group of scholars. Then there is a, another project that is a work in progress and is called Appenine Crossing. And this is a book for a general readership on travelers in the Tuscan mountains from the Middle Ages to the Second World War. Nick Haveli is a member of the Oxford Dante Society, has been a fellow of the Bogliasco Foundation and was recently elected an honorary member of the Dante Society of America. We are absolutely delighted to welcome Nick Haveli. Thank you very much for being here with us this evening. We are looking forward to your presentation, Nick. Right, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Sandra, and thank you and David um, very much for your cortese invito. Um, and um, it's very good to be back. Um, uh, some of you may remember, uh, with reference to that book about the Tuscan mountains, um, I bent your ear about it at some length several years ago in a, in, in a, um, a session which I called Apennine Crossings. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a different journey. Um, and the journey uh, tonight is um, uh, a journey of some 700 years, so I think we had better get going on the uh, the whole story of staging hell um, and I'll begin therefore by sharing the screen uh, right, and setting up right here we go then right um, okay um, so uh, oh I'm not sure I can advance the this the slides uh oh wait a minute i may be able to do that on um, yeah uh right yeah okay um sorry i was trying to do it on the keyboard whereas it should be done on screen uh these new developments right well it's a long journey as i said so we better start by just um uh trying to read the map and um here you've got a diagram of um, the actual journey through hell in the inferno and through the various um, groups of circles. The first group uh, dealing with sins of excess, uh, circles two to fives, sins such as, uh, uh, as lust, gluttony, avarice, uh, etc. Um, and then the third, the second group of sins getting more serious as we go on downwards is the sins of violence, 
um, in Circle 7 in Cantos 12 to 17. And um, uh, lastly, the last main group of sins, uh, which are the most serious because they involve uh, so much of the human will, uh, are the sins which sometimes called fraud, but um, I prefer to use the word fraud for me is, has, has this overtones primarily of financial uh, malfeasance, but um, I prefer to use the term deception. Uh, and even then in the final lowest circles where, the, where sins freeze into the ice, uh, the sins of treachery. So that's the broad outline of Dante's journey. Um, let us now move on to how we're going to address that journey and these approaches that I, I propose to take are, in, are broadly uh, of six kinds. Um, I'll begin by saying a little bit about hell and illustrating a bit about hell as admonitory drama, uh, particularly in the Middle Ages. Then I'll move on closer to Dante, staging hell in medieval Florence and in and the uh, dramatic features of Dante's Commedia itself. Then we go on to how um, Inferno is received in performing terms to recitation and drama from the 14th century through to the 19th. Then fourthly, I want to focus on the treatment reception of two major Dantean tragedies in Inferno, the stories of Francesca in Canto V and uh, Ugolino in Cantos 32 to 3. Um, then we move on to modernity um, and consider how um, performing Dante's hell in one way or another uh, in, on the screen has played to 20th played to 20th century hopes and fears and then finally bring it up to the present I'll explore a variety of performing media um, through the idea of in, in, in contemporary performing media uh, through the idea of multifarious infernos okay so onwards we go then and we start off with um, uh, we start off with uh, the idea of hell as admonition, as um, uh, and here the, I suppose, the, the kind of Christian origin of this uh, is rooted to some extent in that uh, judgment scene in Matthew chapter 25, the last judgment, where you have this dialogue between Christ and the righteous and Christ and the sinners. Um, and this is very much a kind of a dramatic exchange, you know, where um, the, the, the judge speaks to the guilty and the guilty reply and the judge replies again and then there's a sentence. So what you have here is, the, is, is this idea of, of, of hell, eternal punishment, as uh, largely uh, a way of urging uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, urging uh, souls in the present to um, uh, to live to live properly. Okay, so we'll um, we'll now go on to some illustrative examples of that, and one early one. Um, is this realization, visual realization of the last judgment in terms of the metaphor of the sheep and the goats, which is in the mosaic, uh, one of the last 13 mosaics on the life of Christ in the church of Santa Apollinare Nuovo at Ravenna. And you have here, of course, the figure of Christ as judge, as in Matthew 25, with uh, the, uh, the sheep on his right hand, and his hand is opened to them. Uh, with the goats on his left hand and there's no sign of a kind of acknowledgement of them because you, know, you, you have these two uh, um, angels, one in red, uh, the colour of charity, the other in a rather eerie blue which uh, suggests a kind of um, uh, po possibly has a rather, rather sinister overtones uh, as indeed um, is the case with the, uh, the view of judgment in um, a sculpture of, uh, of, of, of 
a, cent a few centuries later in the early 20th, 12th century. This is um, an admonitory sculpt sculpture which has actually uh, a kind of legend on it, as you can see in Latin, uh, which is which uh, which I've translated uh, above. And um, this is, as um, so many Last Judgment scenes, um, is on the west over the west door of uh, the church. In this case, the Romanesque Church of Saint Foy at Conque in southern France. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, the reason for having it over the west door is possible. You know, there are several reasons. I mean, one is that the west that the door points west towards the setting sun uh, and towards the end, the idea of the end of the world. But also, the west door was the door through which the general public would enter and therefore be admonished by the sight of this uh, this sculpture um, above them. Now, thinking of a bit further of how that might develop in theatrical terms, how the admonition might develop in theatrical terms, we're now coming closer to Dante's time. We're actually at the beginning of the century in which he was born. And here you have um, a, a, a vision um, that before Dante, there were quite a lot of visions of the other world. Um, and this is rather interesting one of them, which, in which um, the, uh, this guy, Thurkill, experiences uh, a guided tour of the afterlife. And that guided tour includes um, a, a visit to hell, which is envisaged here as a kind of theater um, in which devils sit in a circle, as it says, as if at a pleasant spectacle, grinning at each other over the tortures, tortures of the wretched beings. And uh, as you can see, uh, this actually involves uh, a kind of almost a, a, literally a coup de théâtre um, where the, uh, the devils drag a proud man from his seat and clothe him in a black garment. Um, and they applaud him as he imitates the gestures of a man proud beyond measure. But then while he is boasting about his dress and putting on his close fitting gloves, his garments suddenly turn to fire, which consume his entire body. So this is the kind of uh, um, uh, coup de théâtre, which I was uh, speaking of in this particular um, uh, uh, Latin vision of the early, early 13th century, right? And then even closer to Dante's time, indeed, um, an image which he is likely uh, more than certainly to have seen as it was in the cupola of the baptistry of San Giovanni, where he himself, as he says, was baptized in 1265. And this is a, a mosaic which indeed may have influenced his own, um, uh, his own imagination because um, uh, it includes, as you can see, this figure of Lucifer or Satan uh, devouring uh, sinners. Uh, here he has um, uh, sort of three heads, as it were, at least, well, at least two subsidiary heads, which seem to be kind of serpent's heads. Um, and uh, it may, it's uh, uh, no coincidence in a way that um, the Lucifer um, at the bottom of Dante's hell is also devouring three sinners and uh, has a head which divides into three with three mouths. So this is um, an interesting example of how Dante uh, might have been uh, affected by the visual culture, uh, the dramatic quite dramatic visual culture of his, uh, of his own time and place. Right, um, questions now about this. Now, was, was hell performed in Dante's time and place? And uh, what kind of drama should we be thinking about? And what are the dramatic features of Dante's Commedia? Okay, um, so let's turn first to this question of was hell do we know whether hell was performed in Dante's time and place? And the answer to that is, may not be a surprise, is yes, um, in the sense that uh, the uh, contemporary chronicler Giovanni Villani actually describes such a, a spectacle of hell 
on the Arno in 1304, which Dante would not have seen, of course, because he was then in exile, um, but he could well have heard about it because of this extraordinary event which took place, this great spectacle of setting up uh, on May Day, uh, setting up um, a representation of hell complete with fires and other kinds of torture um, on the river Arno um, uh, below the Caraya bridge. And as um, uh, Giovanni Villani then rather dryly and sardonically says, that this extraordinary nuovo gioco, as he puts it, um, attracted such a large crowd that the wooden bridge collapsed and a number of people uh, fell into the river and many died of drowning or were mutilated. And as uh, Giovanni uh, Villani says, the play turned from jest into earnest. Il gioco da befe avvenne col vero. And as the announcement had promised, many found out about the other world by going there. Now, thinking about Dante though, he probably, as I said, he may well have heard about that. Um, he also knew that there were um, medieval plays which staged aspects of the Last Judgment or of Hell, particularly the harrowing, the harrowing of Hell, Christ, the way when the, the occasion in, uh, after, immediately after the crucifixion, when Christ re, uh, uh, redeems certain souls of the virtuous from Hell, of the Old Testament patriarchs, for example. Um, so he, uh, he had a sense of a dramatic tradition and there were quite a number of dramatic and performative aspects of the Commedia that we should be bearing in mind. Um, uh, indeed, I mean, it contains, as a number of commentators put, uh, uh, are, are aware, um, both comic and tragic styles. I mean, tragic particularly, of course, in the Inferno. So, um, you know, one wonders why then did Dante call his major poem in the vernacular, why did he call it a uh, commedia, or indeed, as I think he stressed it, commedia. Um, now, one possible reason for that is in a letter which uh, is said to have been written by Dante, but there's a lot of debate about it, explaining uh, the allegory of his work. Um, and in this, he speaks of comedy as that which begins in misery and ends in happiness. And so you could say that you know, that is precisely the case in broad terms with Inferno and uh, uh, the journey from Inferno to Paradiso, but it doesn't get us terribly far. Um, I think other aspects of it are interesting that it, you know, it, 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 uh, it refers also in the Middle Ages to work in the middle style, not in the absolutely high style. And that was always a problem for some of the uh, neoclassical uh, critics of Dante, that it was in this kind of strange mixed style. But um, another aspect of it is, is rather interesting. It's a bit like what Joyce called um, uh, um, Finnegan's Wake, you know, um, here comes everybody. You, you know, it's an inclusive kind of work available to a large audience. Um, looking at the, uh, the, the nature of the dramatic features of the cantique, of the three cantique of the, of, of the Commedia, it might also point out that, you know, in Inferno, especially, though also elsewhere, um, the encounters with the souls have strongly dramatic features of self-revelation or even self-betrayal through dialogue. Um, and that once when you get to, to, to purgatory, uh, you have quite a lot of a sense of spectacle of souls performing texts, uh, singing, um, group activity, a sense of community, and even participating in, um, in, in, in procession, as we see in the, um, the final stage, in the later stages of purgatory, where there is a, um, a procession in the earthly paradise, which, uh, amongst other things, brings Beatrice back to, re to, to be reunited with Dante, uh, 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 and, to accompany, and accompanying that with a rather difficult and tense dialogue between the two of them. Uh, in which Dante himself realizes that he has things to repent of. And 
when we come to Paradiso, although it is mostly the souls are no, no longer seen as bodies, they're seen more as lights, um, we do have a strong sense of patterned movement within the cantica, of sound and even dance. And I think, uh, keep in mind the idea of ballet um, in, uh, in, in relation to performative aspects, uh, particularly in the reception of Dante. Okay, so we will now go on to some of the uh, dramatic aspects of, um, of the Commedia. Um, and we'll start low down um, at a point in Dante's journey through the Inferno where he is in the circles of deception um, and uh, where deception is punished. And he is uh, about to, to encounter devils, the traditional inhabitants of hell with their pitchforks, um, meeting the devils by a river of pitch in which um, uh, the souls of corrupt politicians and administrators are being, um, being tormented. And that canto begins in quite a slow mode uh, with Dante and Virgil sort of moving along, talking to each other, but it's one of the two occasions in the poem in which Dante actually calls his poem a commedia. They are speaking about things of which my comedy does not now care to speak. And the mention of commedia here um, is interesting in connection with what is actually in our sense, more sort of general modern sense comedy, which is about to happen with the portrayal of these traditional devils uh, in a rather grotesque and grimly humorous uh, scene, um, which is illustrated in the next uh, slide by um, a miniature in one of the, the most brilliant of the um, illustrated manuscripts of the, of the Commedia, which is in the British Library, uh, the Yates Thompson 36 manuscript, illuminated this Inferno and Purgatorio being illuminated by uh, Priamo della Quercia in the middle of the, for, of the 15th century. And here you can see as normal reading the illustration from left to right, you have, um, a, rather, a, a really wicked looking black devil um, uh, carrying a sinner on his back and about to plunge that sinner into the river of pitch uh, to the amazement of Virgil in red, Dante in blue. You then have Virgil confronting the threatening devils with their pitchforks um, and uh, Dante cowering behind him. And then on the right of the picture you have Virgil and Dante uh, setting off uh, with the devils as guides on a rather difficult journey because you can never tell whether the devils can be trusted not to have a go at you, uh, which they have wanted to do from the very start of this episode. Okay, um, here is a later illustration. We get on to the next canto where the devils are starting to play games with souls in the, uh, in, in the river of pitch. You can see them poking at them with their halberds at the top of Botticelli's illustration. Um, what will happen is um, that they will, they will fork out a particular soul and uh, that particular soul will, will propose a game, well, to, will, will not propose a game, will, will propose to try and escape their, the, their worst torments by saying he will go and he will go to the bank and whistle so that other souls, that they'll be able to capture other souls. Well, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but in the meantime, you've got this, um, uh, this rather brilliant and very active um, Botticelli illustration with the grotesque figures and faces of the devils clearly peering out at you, um, brandishing, well, not quite uh, pitchforks, they're more like military halberds. Um, and it all seems almost to overwhelm the faint figures, perhaps deliberately overwhelming the faint figures of Dante and Virgil, who you can just see rather faintly etched 
uh, down to the uh, on the uh, right uh, in, the, in the right hand quarter of the of the picture. Right. Well, as I said, um, this turns into um, uh, the, this um, this activity, this performance of the between the devils and the soul that they have captured, turns into what Dante calls, interestingly, uh, a, nuo a nuovo ludo. Uh, actually, using here the term that was uh, commonly used of of a play in the Middle Ages, ludus is the Latin for it, which is common a term that is frequently used to describe um, religious drama. Um, and Dante says to his reader, you know, this is going to be a strange new game because uh, there, there's, uh, the devils are not sure whether to trust this soul to bring them uh, 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 new souls to torment by whistling on the bank. Uh, so one of them says, OK, I'll let you do this, but I'll be after you. Uh, but the soul is actually quicker than they are and plunges back into the pitch and the, the devil goes chasing after them like a hawk after a duck, but the duck has plunged into it, uh, beneath the waves. And um, uh, another angry devil pursues the devil who has, who, has, who has consented to this game. They both collide. And as you can see on the, um, uh, the left-hand side of this illustration from the Holcomb manuscript at Oxford, uh, the, both the devils end up uh, being stewed literally in the boiling pitch, whilst on the right hand side uh, Dante and Virgil are saying goodbye, now we're off, you know, so they, uh, they make their escape uh, into the next circle. Okay, so much for an aspect of comedy in Dante per se. Let's now turn to the third uh, section of my, of my discussion, which is that of the idea of doing things with the Inferno. And I just want to touch here on two early 17th century examples, um, two examples of journeys into a sort of Dantean hell in the early 17th century to give a sample of early modern reception, performative reception of Dante. And uh, one of these is the famous um, uh, proto-opera uh, by, by Claudio Monteverdi, his uh, Favola of Orfeo of 1607, with an important libretto by Alessandro Striccio, um, who himself was, I think, was a composer. Um, and the second is less well known. It's the um, Roman uh, poet and painter Giovanni Giovanni Briccio as comedy La Tartarea uh, Commedia Infernale of uh, around that sort of time, just as about seven staged just about seven years uh, later than uh, Monteverdi's Orfeo. But let's turn first to the Orfeo. And if you know the opera, you'll remember that um, or Orfeo's journey into hell begins uh, at the beginning of Act Three with uh, the appearance of. Uh, of Orfeo with the figure of Speranza, hope, uh, before the gate of hell. And um, Speranza is this, this personified figure, um, sees above the gate of hell, and as she, as in, in her recitative at this point, is actually accompanied by blaring brass, uh, she sees the inscription which is from literally from the third, the beginning of the third canto of Dante's Inferno, lasciate ogni speranza voi che entrate. And um, in a slightly sort of um, jokey way, I guess, on Strigio and uh, Monteverdi's part, this uh, Pope then says, well, sorry, if um, you have to abandon hope, you know, I'm off. Um, so she has, uh, if you have determined in your heart to enter the city of pain, I must leave you and return to my accustomed dwelling, which is a bit of a downer, of course, for, uh, for, for the unfortunate Orfeo, who has to continue on his journey to try to rescue Eurydice. Um, but he does so to a, to a degree also in a slightly Dantean way, because his major aria in Act Three uh, Possenti Spiriti, it's called, it, it begins, is actually um, in Dantean Terza Rima. Okay, so that's the, um, that's an example of how 
uh, Dante's Inferno feeds into uh, uh, a early drama, uh, uh, early modern drama rather. Um, and then in a more, slightly more uproarious way, um, we have Giovanni, Giovanni Briccio's comedy of 1614, La Tartaria Commedia Infernale. Um, and uh, um, it's described as a new and a delightful composition uh, and shows um, uh, um, how virtue is, um, uh, can be acquired solely by, by work of, of great discomfort and labour. And the discomfort and labour is this rather fallible hero um, uh, who again has lost his lady and he seeks with two disorderly servants who seem to have come out of the Commedia dell'arte. He seeks to, and are always getting into trouble because they're in search of food. Um, they seek to rescue a lady who, according to the, the, the preface to the text, signifies virtue. Um, and um, uh, this, um, uh, this all, of course, as the as comedia does, it, it, it ends ends happily with 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 with, uh, with her rescue. But um, uh, she also, um, un not unlike Dante's Beatrice, um, is not hugely impressed by the fecklessness of the hero and his failure to get to to to, to be very effective in the quest to uh, rescue her from the underworld. Um, Okay, and that's and I'll just show you another uh, uh, another illustration from that, which does you know quite uh, specifically recall Dante's Underworld, though with a slightly distorted text. Um, Briccio here uh, in the in the published edition uh, gives an uh, an indication of what you might expect of the stage set, you know, and you have. Uh, the gateway to hell on the left hand side, um, the entry to virtue on the other, and um, the gateway to hell has the inscription above it, uh, which is slightly distorted as uh, perdete ogni speranza voi che entrate, the iron gateway to the underworld. Okay, so we then now are going to move to another area of um, discussion and we to focus more upon two particular infernal examples and their potential for performance, uh, for visualization particularly and performance. But the versions that I've chosen are the very well-known ones of Franci the story of Francesca de Rimi in Inferno 5 and Ugolino uh, della Gerardesca in Inferno 32 to 33. So we begin with Francesca and just to recap the probably quite well-known story, and those of you, I'm sure, who uh, who endured my discussion of William Dice's Francesca uh, several years ago will know all about this, that um, Francesca fell in love with her brother-in-law, Paolo, and they were both murdered by her husband, who in later versions is called Gianciotto. Um, so uh, in Canto V of the Inferno, Dante encounters her, uh, where the souls of the lustful are blown about on la bufera infernal che mai non resta. And she speaks about the irresistible power of love, describes the moment when they fell in love, when, when she and Paolo fell in love, uh, when reading the roman another adulterous romance, that of Lancelot and Guinevere. And the story so affects Dante with pity that he falls in a faint, as if Comio uh, morisse, uh, as if I died. This was turned by Boccaccio into quite a long tragic novella in his lectures on Dante at the end of the Trecento. And from the 18th century onwards, particularly, the episode is frequently portrayed through performance in plays and operas. There were 20 between 1825 and 1914 including a very uh, one that I know of particularly and is rather good um, and has been performed at Holland Park recently, um, the one by uh, um, Zandonai um, with a libretto by Gabriele D'Annunzio, and uh, that's a particularly good one. Um, and then on the cinema screens, there are at least eight movie versions uh, in the 20th century. 
Um, and it's also much dramatized through illustration as in some of the following examples. Here we have examples, right. Here we have an example from the early Romantic period, um, John Flaxman's uh, famous illustration, very influential illustrations of the, uh, of, of, from, from the, uh, of, of the, of the Commedia. And here you have a representation of a scene which uh, Dante only portrays in part, the idea of reading but, um, uh, and, and kissing, but uh, here you have also the idea that the lovers are being at that very point observed by the jealous husband, who in this case, as you can see just at the bottom, is called Lanciotto, but is actually the, uh, that's a kind of slight distortion of the, 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 the name that was given to him in, uh, by Boccaccio, Gianciotto. Um, Lanciotto, I think, is probably a confusion with La, uh, Lancerotto. Um, anyway, that um, is quite a striking staging, as it were, of um, the, uh, uh, the actual adulterous affair. And we then have another instance of it, it's even yet more dramatic, the version um, in the, uh, the drawing by uh, 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 Johann Heinrich Fusli, uh, or Fusili, as he called himself, um, Henry Fusili, um, whose work has been given, get, getting quite a lot of attention more recently with exhibitions. And here you have the scene portrayed in a quasi-balletic form with the lovers actually seeming to be you know, dancing on the terrace um, and uh, looking back into the shrubbery you have the grim looking figure of the jealous husband uh, with his gaze fixed upon them and his hand grasping uh, the dagger on the balustrade. Um, this becomes, comes to be quite uh, a common way of representing um, the romanticism, the adultery of the affair um, in the Romantic period. Um, and it receives a particularly striking and compressed um, version in the painting by uh, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, the French painter, uh, in um, one of the many versions that he did of this subject. I think this is one of the most particularly strikingly compressed versions where you have the moment frozen, the book is halfway between um, Francesca's hand and the floor. Uh, the kiss is about to be landed on her cheek. The cadaverous jealous husband is appearing from behind the arras uh, uh, and unsheathing his sword. So you've got a kind of synchronicity between uh, the reading, the kissing and the murder. And you also have here, I think quite a, uh, you know, a, 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 a version of the, a, 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 um, a, a theme that's going to become enormously popular in the 19th century, the sort of the, the theme of, um, of adultery and the fallen woman, but particularly also the kind of what one might call the Tristan theme, that of the, uh, the, uh, um, the young uh, lover who is in love with, um, uh, with, with his relative's uh, wife. Uh, as with Tristan, uh, Isolde, and uh, and King Mark uh, in in the, in the Tristan legend. Going back to the Middle Ages, um, if we look at how this scene is represented in Dante's Hell, uh, as we know, it's it's represented in terms of um, a moment in the encounter with souls who have the broader encounter with souls who have subordinated reason to passion and are thus tormented in this in, in, in the in the storm and here you have again that Yates Thompson manuscript illustrating this uh, with um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, with also I think uh, some kind of 
dark devilry in the, uh, on the left-hand side. Um, and um, that same manuscript, sorry, I'll just get advanced, that, that same manuscript um, tells the story a bit more clearly. Um, you have the souls again being blown on the storm. You have Virgil pointing on the left hand side, uh, Virgil pointing them out to Dante and pointing out this uh, Virgil's claim that these are the souls who they are here because they subordinated reason to passion. Then you have uh, on the far right the two, Paolo, uh, Francesca and Paolo with Francesca telling the story and in the middle, middle of the scene, you have this, the effect, the effect on Dante of uh, uh, casting him into a faint through the effect of um, excessive involvement and pity. Um, right, and of course, there's quite a lot to argue with here about the nature of judgment, the nature of Virgil's claim that this is this is what happens to those who subordinate reason to passion. Um, you know, could Francesca have helped it? Boccaccio says probably not because she was deceived into marrying Gian Ciotto. She thought she was marrying Paolo. Anyway, another argument continues in the Romantic period, another argument with Dante's uh, judgment and is here in a uh, highly dramatic form in, the, uh, in, in William Blake's uh, version of Hell, uh, where you can see Blake is actually more or less celebrating the love of um, Paolo and Francesca by placing a faint image of them embracing in that sunburst medallion on the, uh, the right hand side of the picture above Virgil's head and above the prostrate uh, uh, figure of Dante as um, the, the two lovers, Paolo and Francesca, are blown away into the storm like Keatsian lovers. Okay, we move on to uh, Count Ugolino um, in, in further, further down into hell. The, uh, we move from largely pity to terror, and we move to this figure of uh, Ugolino who is seen, who was a traitor to his city himself, that's why he's low down in hell, but was also captured by another treacherous character, his political enemy, the Archbishop Ruggieri imprisoned with his children, starved to death in the Tower of Hunger, and he tells Dante the story of his death as he raises his head from gnawing his enemy's head. They're both now locked in the ice. Um, and this story was dramatized in the 17th and 18th centuries and was translated indeed also in modern times in the final poem of Seamus Heaney's fieldwork with some relevance to the factional strife in the, uh, during the Northern Irish troubles. Um, the Ugolino story was in the uh, quite early on in Chaucer's, uh, by Chaucer um, retold in a way that stressed um, it's pathos because Chaucer turns Ugolino's adult children who, who Dante says were, and the, le the legend says were, were locked into the tower with him to starve. He turns them into little, little children um, uh, of less than five years old and sees them as, uh, as, as all victims of the tragedy of fortune. Birds put into such a cage, he says. Um, making a leap back to the Romantic period and how Ugolino is represented in that period. Here again, Fuseli is, is the man and um, very striking image of a kind of um, a, a very performative image indeed of Dante conjuring up the story of Ugolino as Ugolino raises his face from gnawing the back of his enemy's head and Dante stands there somewhat like some kind of sorcerer uh, or necromancer. Uh, 
Ugolino also came then, came to be seen not only as a figure of pathos, but also as a kind of figure of a, almost a kind of political heroism. In the 18th century, he was regarded as a kind of victim of the, of the Catholic clergy, uh, since he was, uh, uh, since his enemy was this Archbishop of Pisa. And Ugolino is also seen as a kind of figure of, um, uh, of stoical endurance, as you can see from Fusilli, another attempt by Fusilli to represent the story in which um, this figure of Ugolino is, is staring out challengingly, defiantly um, at the viewer um, in, in this, uh, in this uh, now lost painting by, uh, by Fusilli. Um, and that refle is, was reflected in some of the drama of the period. Um, there was a famous uh, and very impressive um, five act tragedy um, on the subject of Ugolino that was performed uh, in 1769 by um, von Gerstenberg. And in this, um, uh, which is based, he says, on the story known, to Dan known through Dante. And um, in this, he does indeed turn um, uh, Ugolino into a figure of Job-like um, uh, endurance. Uh, this is among, in his one of his his last speech, which takes on the tones of of of, of Job's um, uh, of, of at least the address to Job. You know, can you knit together the bonds of the seven stars? Can you usher in the morning at star at its due time, or guide the chariot of heavens above its children? Do you know how the heavens are governed? You know, in other words, how limited uh, human capacities are. Can you on earth control them? And then he resolves, you know, I will gird up, and quoting, literally quoting Job at the end of the book of Job, I will gird up my loins like a man. He becomes that figure of endurance at the end of the play. And uh, Ugolino continued to be performed with a kind of political overtone in the um, early 19th century. One of the, the most famous tragic actors or Italian tragic actors of the period, Gustavo Modena, was himself a political activist and exile. And this is um, uh, a, a snatch from a uh, a letter written about him by a friend to people back in Italy, uh, reporting how he had performed to terrific effect um, the, the, um, the story of Ugolino, and very interestingly, also giving a very, very detailed account of um, how um, uh, the, the great actor's expressions change, how he modulates from cries of despair to impassioned pleas and from the fury of vengeance to the tender sorrow of a wretched father, and, and how his gestures are so fine and compelling that even without understanding what he is saying, people are profoundly moved. Uh, this is a very striking uh, example um, that, um, uh, of, of, of um, a description of, of, of how Dante might have been recited and performed in, uh, at this period. Um, indeed, there's uh, uh, the next account of uh, um, Modena's performances as he moves to Paris is a bit more skeptical and another famous um, fellow exile who knew Modena, Giuseppe Mazzini, um, takes a rather more, uh, a, a less admiring view of him uh, because he thinks that uh, uh, Gustavo is milking it for all it's worth uh, and he, uh, he says he goes around performing uh, Count Ugolino and soaking up applause from everyone, the papers are full of it. And indeed, the act did continue in this country um, shortly after that, because in order to raise funds to go back to Italy, uh, Modena staged a benefit recital or declamation, grand declamation, grand morning concert with choice specimens of Italian declamation um, in London in May 1839. And this included him performing uh, Ugolino along with other performers uh, doing a, a program of operatic arias from uh, Donizetti. It would have been quite a fun thing to attend, I think. Uh, and probably quite impressive as well. I mean, uh, judging from what was said about the way that uh, Modena was capable of performing uh, Ugolino. Okay, we're now moving onwards and towards the end um, with some examples of how in the 20th century, 
infernos have been translated particularly onto that particular 20th century medium, the cinema screen. And I'm just going to take, give you th three brief examples here. One of uh, um, the early Italian, uh, 1911 Italian Inferno, uh, one of the earliest full length feature films. Secondly, a war film, uh, Vaida's Canal, 1956. And then a, um, a somewhat weird, um, but very interesting, um, surreal kind of um, hell in an American suburb. Uh, David Lynch's Blue Velvet. So first of all, let's just take a quick look at images from the, uh, uh, the Inferno of 1911, uh, national cultural event. Nationality is very important in this and, and uh, it's, it's described also as uh, uh, um, uh, grandioso successo and on the poster it's grandioso film d'arte. Um, it was a highly successful film internationally, in fact, as well as in Italy. But for Italy, it had the kind of additional nationalistic uh, um, force. For example, it contains certain symbols of national identity, such as in, in Limbo, where Dante meets the classical poets. They say farewell to him by giving Dante and Virgil the saluto romano, which of course became the in infamous uh, fascist salute, but later in the century. Um, also uh, contentious was um, this very last image of the film which showed the monument to Dante in uh, Trento, which at that very time was occupied by the Austrians. And this uh, uh, rendered the film subject to censorship because at that point, 1911, uh, the Italian government was considering an alliance with Austria. So this was not a very good idea to, um, uh, to, to include that at the end of, 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 of the movie. Um, then uh, connecting Hell, Dante's Inferno with war again, we have um, uh, this movie, Polish movie by Andrus Wajda, um, Kanau of 1956, which was part two of the, the one of the greatest uh, movie productions of the post-war period, Vida's Ashes and Diamonds. And in this uh, part, um, Canal, uh, is the story of a group of um, resistance fighters from the po Polish Home Army at the end of the Warsaw Rising, taking refuge in the sewers. And indeed, at one point in the narrative, um, one of the those uh, and, uh, soldiers, an educated reader of Dante actually compares their situation to the souls who were in a circle of hell, the circle of hell in Inferno 18, um, uh, stifled in shit which seemed to come from human privies. Um, it's a very impressive movie and perhaps even more impressive for its obliqueness of approach to the Inferno story. Um, Another also in different way impressive and oblique version of, um, uh, of, of, of Dante's Inferno is uh, David Lynch's Blue Velvet, which um, uh, suggests uh, in its very opening sequence, which I, uh, um, I, I won't tell you in detail about now, just suggests very vividly that all is not well beneath the surface of the clipped lawns of American suburbia and its innocent all-American hero Jeffrey goes on a surreal journey exploring the violent underworld that lies close at hand while seeking to maintain links with respectability in the form of his fair-haired girlfriend and her detective father who is helping him in his um, in his quest to find out what's going on beneath the surface of, uh, of, of this uh, su supposedly quiet American suburb, the kind of crime world that lies beneath. And here you have images from that. You have the figure of Dorothy, the seductive Dorothy, whom uh, Jeffrey encounters and who sings uh, seductively the actual theme song, uh, Blue Velvet. You have uh, the diabolically vi violent Frank, whom, who beats up Jeffrey, and you have down in the uh, left-hand corner, you have Jeffrey um, seeking redemption and coffee with, um, with, with the lovely Sandy, 
um, who is in a sense a kind of rather ineffective Beatrice in this uh, in this scenario. Okay, well, those are some those are some twentieth century examples. We're now going to move on to our final section. I mean, once I've found, uh, whoop, yeah, here we are. Um, final section. Um, Multifarious Inferno is bringing the whole thing up to the present. I'm just going to go very rapidly give some examples of media, contemporary media, 21st century media, in which Inferno features in, in one way or another. And these again are movies, there's stage, there's recitation, as of course with Gustavo Modena back in the 19th century, and recitation long before that in the tradition of uh, performing Dante. Uh, video, puppetry, ballet, robotics. Let's just have a quick look then at, um, um, at, at an example of modern movies. And this, I think, one of the, the best of these, again, a, an oblique version of the Inferno journey is the, uh, the 2005 movie of the death of Mr. Lazarescu. Um, and um, this features a character whose name actually is Dante. Dante is called Dante Lazarescu. Um, he, uh, who is uh, um, uh, um, an ailing old man who is taken on this rather uh, hopeless journey through the uh, the uh, Bucharest um, hospital system, um, as as the review here says, the cyclical cyclical routines would match anyone's idea of hell, um, and. Um, uh, it is, as the review says, a, a very fine portrayal of a man increasingly aware that he's crossing the bridge between life and death, but fiercely determined not to go without a fight. And here is uh, an image of uh, the patient Dante Lazarescu and the, the patient, long-suffering paramedic Miwara, um, whom he, who he actually at one point calls Beatrice. Um, and he is here awaiting diagnosis in one of the many hospitals that they have to visit on their journey. Um, turning to another medium, that of contemporary theatre, um, I don't know if any of you may have seen, it, was, it came to London in 2009, this avant-garde um, drama of uh, the whole of the Commedia, in fact, beginning with Inferno, by, the, by Romeo Castellucci and an Italian theatre company. And here you have some sense of what's going on. You've got the, the entry into hell, but um, you've got a, a kind of well-padded figure being savaged by actually real guard dogs on stage, well-trained guard dogs, one uh, would hasten to add. Um, it's um, a rather slightly more precise idea of, um, of, of the pointlessness of the journey um, is this image of the crash car with a kind of Dante figure with an Andy Warhol wig um, sitting on its bonnet. Um, uh, it's it's an interpretation which grew, I found, increasingly bemusing and increasingly beset with um, certain surreal cliches. There was an e even uh, perhaps the ultimate surreal cliche, uh, you know, a grand piano that bursts into flames. Anyway, um, we'll move on to another medium. A much more persuasive performance, in my view, that of uh, Roberto Benigni, who has for a long period engaged in Tutto Dante performances. Um, and he came to London in, uh, in April 2009, um, and I was lucky enough to see that. Uh, and he was, uh, it was an extraordinary sort of very controlled performance of the Francesca Canto, but surrounded by a lot of Benigni kind of uh, political and comical and satirical stuff, including him claiming that him coming to London to talk about Dante was a bit like Mr. Bean going to Rome to talk about Milton. And he then says, you know, Dante language, sublime, mine, revolting. And he was actually using kind of cod Italian accent in order to do so, because I'm sure his English is a whole lot better than that. Anyway, um, another medium that has, a certain, has, has had quite an effect has been the turning of Dante's uh, Inferno into the video medium. The Californian uh, video company Electronic Arts um, uh, uh, developed 
what they call great gameplay and great story. Of course, it is a great story. And um, uh, they even managed to achieve a, a movie spin-off from it, um, which is worth ha having a look at if, you, uh, if you're interested. It oddly, of course, turns uh, the whole story not unlike Monteverdi's Orfeo, into some kind, into a kind of rescue narrative, which of course isn't the, uh, well, uh, Dante's Inferno is a rescue of his own soul, but in this, in this it's, he's, he's rescuing uh, Beatrice, who has somehow got kidnapped by the devil. Uh, and in the course of it, he becomes, he is a former crusader who uh, now becomes a great demon slayer. And here is, a, you know, this is an, uh, a still of him dealing uh, in a very finely animated version um, with uh, a particular demon, a prostrate demon. Okay, um, another medium which also developed a movie um, is puppetry. And another fascinating um, uh, Inferno movie of the 21st century is Sean Meredith's um, 2007 Dante's Inferno, which um, turned the text um, into what one critic has called California inflected youth speak. But it's actually a bit more serious than that because it does also um, do what a lot of modern narratives of Inferno do. In other words, um, um, turn the, the story into um, a kind of way of looking at the modern at the modern city. And here we have a background scene from the puppet version, which um, does show the, uh, the the background against which the journey um, in this movie's hell takes place through sewage filled rivers, hellish hot tubs, gated communities and satanic car dealerships. Um, so this is a way of uh, achieving what in performance what we could call a kind of a, 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 a very striking cultural translation of the Inferno. Um, and another way of, as I um, suggested before, another way of translating Dan uh, Dante's Inferno, which has been done quite a lot, is as dance. And here we have, you know, a scene from um, uh, Frederick Ashton's choreographed uh, Dante Sonata in 1913, which was revived in 2000. And uh, some of you may know um, that there will be another Dante ballet taking place at Covent Garden, a different one, differently choreographed to the music of Thomas Addis um, at the end of the coming month. Um, and as I said, ballet is quite a striking way of interpreting uh, the movements of the, uh, of the damned souls and of the journey in, in hell. And here you have a modern Austrian ballet with these kind of de demonic dancers in the background and this kind of gray suffering figure um, in the foreground. One does, I'm not quite sure whether it's meant to be Dante or um, a, a soul in Dante's hell. Um, and then finally, bringing us right up to our, uh, up to the culture of artificial intelligence, we have robotics and uh, this particular um, uh, robotic performance involve putting members of the audience into exoskeletons and uh, they could, they would be controlled either by themselves or more scarily by the computer or by the audience. And so this inferno, as the, the, uh, as, as the producers say, questions the nature of control, mechanical or human, coerced or voluntary, and makes one think of the direction of the AI culture generally. And then finally, up to the very present, um, more robotics, there is actually a robotic artist called Aida, A-I-Da, um, who, whose work leads us to ask uh, whether artwork can be con produced by machines can be called art, but she can apparently draw and engage in discussion. And uh, she will, in, 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 in fact, be responding to a text from Dante on an occasion at the uh, Ashmolean Museum in Oxford this autumn as part of, this is my final slide, um, yes, uh, as part of the Oxford Dante Festival 2021 and the Dante Fortnight in uh, the first two weeks of November, which includes 
all singing, all dancing, exhibitions, movies, public lectures and conversations, book launches, and a concert. And as I say here, like Dante's own work in the vernacular, a party to which everyone is invited. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fantastic presentation and beautiful overview of Dante's representation through the centuries. So I'll stop, shall I stop sharing? Yes, please, like, yes. Right. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. So I think <laughs> we can open uh, to the floor and if there is anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question, please feel free to unmute yourselves or write your questions in the chat at the bottom and Francesca maybe you want to ask something I cannot hear you though <laughs> you need okay. to unmute yourself <laughs> <laughs> me now yes I can hear you now no I just wanted to thank uh, thank very much the professor for a wonderful varied presentation um, I wish I had him as a teacher when I was studying it for so many years of my life. Um, however, uh, I really enjoyed it and I've come to Dante many, many occasions throughout my lifetime and um, I'm still there with him. So uh, I'm with you tonight as um, a compendium of all my studying and appreciation of Dante. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you for the kind words. I would just add, uh, as, you know, as, I think uh, what you're interestingly implying is what has been pointed to as the, you know, the one of the reasons for the um, uh, for, for 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 the persistence of interest in Dante is it's is is the texts, particularly the Commedia, is its very versatility, as it's been called, you know, and its its generosity. It's continually capable of being reinvented. That's very true. May I ask you, how did you become interested in Dante in the first place? Is it something that happened at school when you were at school? How did you think to specialize? No. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. It's very interesting. I'm, I'm really a rather late comer. And um, I, I didn't start, uh, I didn't even start learning. Um, my Italian is a, is, is a bit of a blunt instrument, actually, it has to be said. Um, I, um, I didn't start um, uh, work on Dante until after my first degree, which was in English. You know, and then I only did a module on Dante as part of my um, taught second degree at Oxford. And um, uh, I think it was partly because I wanted in that degree to, to, to um, uh, I, I was following sort of Roger Bacon's idea that, you know, the first duty of the scholar is to learn languages. And so I decided I was going to do modules in all, quite a few different languages, Middle English, uh, Medieval French, Icelandic, and of course Italian, and so th that, that came. And then I reported to my teacher at Oxford, tutor, um, who was actually a classics teacher, um, and um, uh, it, was the, it was the just before the term in which, it, which the tutorials were about to start, and I was supposed to be starting reading Dante, and so I said to him, no, well, how do I go about learning you know, Italian in order to read this? You know. So, you know, he drew, there was a sharp intake of breath, and he said, uh, the motto of Oxford, Mr. Haverley, is you are expected to know. So <laughs> off I go to, off I go to Blackwell's bookshop and get Teach Yourself Italian, which is by the, the wonderful Catherine, Catherine Spate, and, um, uh, and engaged in lots of dialogues between the cook and the postman, you know. Um, uh, and then I, I, I sort of struggle through the Sinclair uh, um, uh, parallel text. I then get, I still got a very dog-eared copy of Sapegno's edition, you know, which was the one, the one that I really got to with the first Italian uh, edition with commentary. Um, but yes, I think it's, um, uh, it, 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 um, it's, it's kind of an interest 
that maybe stems from my um, uh, slightly kind of uh, non-English background, in fact, significantly non-English background, because my father was a Parsi. And um, uh, I think there's probably quite a lot of uh, of, um, uh, of, of kind of um, uh, parallels between Parsi culture and Italian. Um, uh, anyway, um, which I won't go into now. Um, but um, uh, I, I think that's one of the reasons. And I, I think it was, it, it was also the continuing challenge of the language, really, which I still, I'm not sure I've really quite got control of, but um, uh, I think is, um, it, 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 it's worth persevering anyway. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who would like to ask or comment? Um, Sandra, uh, yes. can you hear me? Yes, of course, yes. Uh, um, the professor now has just mentioned Sapegno. Perhaps he would be interested to know that uh, at the very end of his life, he was still giving Dante readings. And uh, I was privileged to be uh, in the audience um, in my university, in Naples, when he came and gave us some wonderful, wonderful readings. And then soon after that, it was very frail. And soon after that, then he died. But uh, that was a great, um, I remember it very, very vividly because that obviously uh, quite a few of the teachers were not anywhere near the standard of Sapegno and the likes. But uh, also being called Francesca, in a certain way throughout my life. I've felt a sort of ownership <laughs> for that uh, and so on. So, but really enjoyed it tonight. Thanks again. Yes. Well, thank you. I mean, that, that, for, for that memory, that's really very interesting. And it, I, I could do a little parallel with that because um, shortly before his death, um, uh, um, the great Gustavo Modena, this um, this Italian, uh, this 19th century um, tragedy, tragic actor, um, he was engaged in what he called, uh, he was doing readings right up until his death in the 1860s that he called Dantate. Um, and um, he, uh, uh, he, he, he did, um, it was just before his death that he did his final readings in, in, yeah. in, in, in Naples um, on, on tour. You know, uh, he said, I will go on tour with the little Dante pills in my case, <laughs> in Della Valigia, you know. And he said, he actually speaks of, you know, I must do this, you know, for the last time, per abbaiare una sera, you know, <laughs> to park for an evening. You know. Okay. Yeah. It's an interesting way of describing his mode of performance. How did Sapegno, uh, did he do it in a, in a very, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a very abayare way, or did he do no. it in a quite quiet control? I, I think he was quite tired by then, and yeah. uh, he stood on the podium, as it were, like a little stage, and uh, hmm. he, he was quiet, and then... Uh, uh, very little gesturing, you know, so yeah. I think he did it as an homage, but uh, he, he was too tired by then. <laughs> Do you remember which, which parts he did? Uh, well, he did uh, the Paolo and Francesca. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. And then, uh, because of course I remember that hmm. for obvious reasons, but no, I don't remember what else he did. Okay. No. But that's uh, yeah, that, that's that's fascinating. Yes, yes. because you, you know that um, I mean, you can hear um, there's there's another famous Dante scholar, Lino Pertile. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yes. Uh, who um, has recorded um, uh, the whole of the Commedia uh, online. You can you can access it via the um, Dartmouth Dante project. Uh -huh. or, uh, well. Um, Sorry, one of my greatest heroes was uh, Vittorio Gassman. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Who and the fact that he was so good looking, he yes. just could. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. It was a, a uh, wonderful, wonderful yeah. uh, actor and the way he was almost natural to him. He, he yeah. just knew it all by heart and uh, yes. yes. That's absolutely what the, uh, yes. Um, 
uh, yes, there's uh, and th there's all that that's knowing knowing it by heart. That I think is important. That's what Benigni does. Yes, know? that's and right. I think um, uh, what's what's the other guy's name? Vittorio. Uh, I can't um, no, I can't remember. Um, but anyway. Um, the idea of doing it by heart is is is, is important, and um, I think the way probably not to do it is the way in which there's another actor called Car Carmelo Beni, um, who did a, a very worthy performance in Bologna in memory of the you know those who died in the um, uh, in the explosion at the station, and um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, unfortunately it was you know he he delivered it from one of the uh, the Torre, the towers in the middle yeah. of Bologna, uh, out of a window with the book in his hand, <laughs> and he read the, the, the Canto di Ulisse. Uh, mm. and the problem was he was he'd started quite sort of high and went higher and higher and higher. You wonder whether he was actually going to <laughs> explode at the end of it. You know, it was really one of those performances which, uh, you know, reminds you of uh, the kind of um, you know, mock rhetoric of, uh, of the Commedia dell'arte in many ways. I, I think it's much better to do it, you know, as Benigni does, you know, uh, 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 rather more restrained, you know, you have to have those powerful moments, obviously, mm. but, you know, they, it needs some, some degree of restraint, I think. Um, mm. Otherwise it just gets overpowering and much too vibrating. <laughs> mm. um, but that's, it, that's fascinating to hear about Sapeño. He, he is, of course, memorialized uh, in the, that institute in um, Morgex in northern Italy. Um, his, his, uh, you know, there is a premio Sapeño for Dante scholars, and they have a conference okay. each year. Mm. Right. Well, thanks for that. Thank memory. you. That's very fascinating. Mm. Thank you very much. I just want to ask one last question, maybe, and and then we can close. I was thinking about audiences, and I was thinking about the, do we know anything about the patterns of those beautiful illuminations of those beautiful manuscripts? Um, that's, yeah, I mean, we know of some aristocratic patrons just from the dedications, I think, but not much. Um, we know a bit more about not, the well, about the mercantile readership. You know, um, because, uh, and that is interesting because it reflects how, you know, very early on the Commedia becomes the property of, uh, becomes accessible because it's in the vernacular and becomes popular. Indeed, much to the distress of some of the academics and intellectuals of the Trecento who think that it really should have been written in Latin you know, and should not be casting pearls before swine and so on. But it does very much become, uh, from very early on, um, the readership is, is, is of a mercantile level. And we do know uh, that um, you know, there are certain um, uh, mercantile authors um, who comment, Italian, uh, uh, Florentine authors like um, uh, Antonio Pucci, Know, who 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 comment on Dante, you know, and who receive Dante and describe themselves as, uh, you know, it's rather grossolani, but you know, they are they are nonetheless they are the you know those who 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 mediate the you know the great work to a wider public, which is one of the, you know the fascinating things about the whole text, I think, um, and we do know that that continued actually. Um, Boccaccio gave those lectures to you know to an audience in a church in, in, in Florence in the 1370s. Um, we know that um, uh, in the early modern period, recitation, even in the period of printing, recitation continues, and that um, uh, at least one um, enterprise at a certain point with the Academia uh, Fiorentina in its early years, it was very much committed to presenting Dante to a wider public mm -hmm. on certain days of the week. Um, so it is, you know, that's very much uh, in, um, to do with the idea of the audience, uh, an, 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 an audience, a readership, and those who hear as well. But the, the readership we do know a bit about, yes, from notes on the manuscripts. Mm -hmm. um, 
indeed one merchant says, you know, I finished copying this manuscript on a journey to um, uh, to southern Italy, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a, um, a, 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 a commercial trip. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very much taken up by, uh, by, by that group. You know. Thank you very much. So, I, I think that uh, everyone can join me in thanking Professor Nick Havely for being here this evening for this fantastic overview. Thank you for being with us. Just a couple of things before, before we close, but yes, absolutely, please clap with me because this is a very well-deserved um, you know, recognition of, of a wonderful evening. Uh, I would just like to say a couple of things before we say goodbye. Uh, we have an online social event uh, on Tuesday, 5th of October. So if you have booked uh, yourself for the online uh, wine tasting, you are going to discover with us and Carol Brown, the wines of Northern Italy from Piemonte and the Veneto. The next cultural event is going to be on the 28th of October which is also a Thursday, we will be in conversation with Stefano Benazzo, who is a, a former ambassador of Italy, a sculptor, a model maker and a photographer. He's currently exhibiting his work at the Accademia delle Arti and del Disegno in Florence, in Via Ricasoli, just very close to Piazza San Marco. So if you happen to be in Florence in October, you may want to visit his exhibition. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see you at the end of October. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much to Professor Haveli. Thank you. Could I, could thank I just you. thank you very yes, much uh, for, for, for this. Uh, it, it's, uh, and I, I do look forward to seeing you again at some point, maybe in person. Meanwhile, I will stage my own reception by having a glass of wine after this. <laughs> instead of, instead of four. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. Beautiful, fantastic. We are looking forward to being able to host you in person as soon as it is oh, possible. Thanks again and uh, Thank greetings to all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you and continue to follow us. Look at our program uh, on aberdeenitaliancircle.org slash forward program. Good night. Impressive enterprise. <laughs> Buonasera. Bye. Buonasera.